Omis, welcome to a special bonus episode of the Agora podcast. We have with us today John John from Float Capital. How are you going, John John? Hey, Mark. Great, thanks. And yourself, absolutely, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, very well today. It's a nice afternoon and your your early morning. <laughs> it's hard to find a time that sort of fits around the world. So first, I just want to <laughs> clear up for everyone. This is Float Capital, which isn't to be confused with Float Protocol. And Float Protocol is that kind of dollar that they have the, like the founders have taken a Beatles kind of persona and they have Float which is a floating um, stable-ish asset, whereas Float Capital is a project building synthetic assets on top of Polygon. Is that a good summary of Float Capital? Yeah, Mark, that's that's great. So I th- sometimes actually how we even term it now is we say we create magic internet assets. We sort of form these things, users bring thy die. And with that, you know, we turn them into all of these interesting types of objects that they can use for, you know, a variety of reasons. One of them being uh, the leveraged ohm synth or the leveraged ohm magic internet asset or Mia for short, which we can, yeah, we'll get into that a little bit later, I guess. Yeah, I think like memes are important in sort of helping people understand like what products are. But maybe if we could sort of start off with your journey as like a founder and like how you got into crypto, what you were doing beforehand, uh, more and more, <laughs> I interview people and they say, oh, it's like my first job. I'm like a founder straight out of like university. But yeah, what was your background before crypto and like, how'd you fall into it? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So, you know, obviously when you like come out of school, you often wonder what do you want to do? And I was, you know, thinking a lot about that. And originally I thought of going down maybe the actuarial uh, science path. And then from that, I actually got a, a computer science course I had to take. And I think up until this point, I was very uncertain and, you know, like what computer science actually was. And to my best knowledge, you know, computer science was helping fix computers that were broken and that have crashed. And, you know, um, I, it's like, you know, when your mom calls you and she's like, Microsoft Word's not opening, you know, come help me. <laughs> that was my naive um, thought of what computer science was. And then when I realized, you know, how interesting it was, one of the first assignments was creating a program to solve a Sudoku puzzle. And that is just something that, you know, requires, you know, both creativity, but also sort of a lot of logic and execution and putting all of these pieces together. Um, and it was, it was a lot of freedom. And, and I thought it was really cool being able to, to solve complex problems and leverage a computer to do that. So that thus began, uh, began the journey of computer science. And after studying computer science for, you know, this was, I think, my, for my fourth year or fifth year in honors, um, I did mathematics as well. And doing sort of a business stream, I had to do a marketing project. So pretty funny that computer science is not what led me to, to Bitcoin, but it was actually marketing <laughs> or professional communication. And my brother sent me like a leaflet on blockchain. And, you know, back in those days, I think this was 2016, there was like blockchains going to solve transport problems and this and that and it was a lot of real yeah, world co- things. colored coins was another i remember that was all the rage for like <laughs> like two years or something uh, exactly so it was it was ages ago in the beginning and i did this like professional communication whole speech on blockchain and, and what it's going to do and then from there i thought you know well i do computer science i do sort of math i, c- I can actually dig into this stuff and, and understand it and my co-founder, who's who's not here today, Jason, we actually met when we were real youngsters. Maybe we were 12 years old at a math competition, and we ended up studying comp sci together. <laughs> but then we finished and graduated at uni, and we also actually met our third co-founder, um, Denim, studying comp sci at uni. It's so funny. We even used to do projects together. And yeah, from there, uh, we essentially all went out and did different things for quite a while. So Jason went to work for Consensus. Um, Denim went and did a lot of awesome works with startups. 
I went and did a master's in data science and, and we, we went through this, this process of all getting involved in lots of different things, which was really exciting. And I would say what, what brought us back together after, you know, we all spent about two years in, in industry. I was also working in a, a startup looking at applying machine learning to give users sort of smart beta exposure. So if you have an index fund, like of passive investments, and you want to sort of manage the risk on that index fund, you know, this algorithm would, would help you do that, right? Anyways, after that point in time, we came back and we did a, a hackathon. The ones I was going to were Ethereum hackathons. So sort of the only like prescription was basically build something cool on Ethereum. And you know how much cool stuff you can build on Ethereum. And back in the day here, yeah, I mean, there wasn't even a worry about gas prices. So it's just koi and deploy onto mainnet, you know. So that was really cool. And in your team of three, four, five, you try think of a cool idea. And, you know, that's where a lot of cool things get launched. Um, you obviously probably be familiar uh, with One Inch and, you know, what they've built. And, you know, we, we hack quite a few times alongside um, them at these Ethereum hackathons. And, you know, check how big One Inch has got. So there's a lot of cool ideas that come from hackathons. So it's, it's really a cool place to be able to, you know, set everything aside and, purely focus on like getting as much progress and building as much as possible on one thing yeah so when was this the first one you did together um uh, maybe beginning of 2018 uh, so that was ethereum cape town and we we went on to do i think eth india eth paris eth berlin eth london and the thesis was you know let's just travel the world and learn and build cool products at all these places and and sharpen our Ethereum skills and meet builders around the world to bring different perspectives. That's amazing. It must have been great for networking as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's where we've built up most of our network. And sometimes you only realize it later, like, wow, I was meeting all these cool people. I'm so so glad I met all of them. But yeah, I mean, it was a, a cool journey of building. And maybe I'll just take one minute to tell you about one of the, the cool things we built or some of the cool things we built. Yeah, interested in your war stories from the hackathon days. Oof, yeah, man, there are some war stories as well. So we actually <laughs> we actually changed our idea once or twice during the hackathon even. We were really thinking, like, what do we do? And <laughs> eventually we settled on this this idea of of raising funds for animal conservation using something called Harburg Attacks, and it sounded pretty gnarly and this is an NFT project that's now like three years ago. So maybe it was the wrong time to be doing NFTs. But it was it was really cool. We managed to launch it. And actually afterwards, we kept working on it from the hackathon. And we, we managed to raise about $250,000 for animal conservations around the world. And, you know, it's it's still live and working. So, yeah, that's wildcards.world. And that was really cool. And I think building these applications on ethereum there's so many things to consider you know i think a lot of people don't just build what their final product is on their first go you know you build a lot of different things you, you understand you learn how they integrate with each other but yeah that was that was a great time very cool so you're an omi yourself john john can you tell us about just how you discovered om and then like what your first impressions were of it yeah so i think the first time i started noticing it is i just saw loads of like you know three comma three and i was wondering like whoa what's going on like i started seeing it more and more and more until eventually i was like you know i can't be the only person on the internet who doesn't know what this is like i can't keep pretending i actually know what it means let me go find out what this is about and then i started reading a bit and I understood it was sort of this, you know, like um, prisoner's dilemma or, you know, and like Nash equilibrium of, you know, everyone should perform these two actions, stake, stake, and like this will produce this desired result. And, you know, I'm, I'm curious on a lot of protocols, you know, building a protocol um, myself with the legends I build alongside, you know, we want to rub a lot of ideas and you know, talk about different things people are doing. And, you know, there's a lot of smart minds in the industry. So it's awesome to be able to discuss what other people are doing and what's being successful. So, you know, I wanted to look in a bit into sort of how it worked. And 
one of my friends actually, Jono, he he done a bit more research on it and he basically, you know, talked a lot and, and explained to me really in depth how the, the protocol controlled liquidity worked and it was just really smart, right? So because Ohm is able to own all of its liquidity, that means the depth of the liquidity is not so volatile. And if there's less volatility in the depth of the liquidity, that means, you know, any types of trading on that liquidity pair, you know, they're not going to have as much um, impact on price movements in an AMM environment. So, you know, I just thought that was really nice being able to basically protect against these large removals of liquidity that would then lead to larger price shocks because you don't have enough liquidity to basically make that AMM less vulnerable to that type of thing. So just thought it was, you know, a, a really cool concept and, and seriously interesting. And, you know, I think the cool thing we get in blockchain is you, there's so much composability. The fact that you can get an ERC-20 token representing, you know, your LP position and that you are a liquidity provider, how, how cool is that? And that you can then send that somewhere else and, and do stuff for a service like... Yeah, it's just it's just really interesting. So I thought that was really cool and I haven't seen anyone else tackle that. So, you know, props to Ohm for being so innovative. I think it's, I think it's it's really cool and you know, everyone in this space, I think we we building and experimenting and trying to understand how things can work and you know, really just being creative. So, yeah, I think that was really cool and that was sort of my journey to figuring out more about Ohm and then obviously learning a bit about the rebase rewards and everything. It was this idea of, you know, ooh, a, a synthetic could be really valuable for, you know, this type of protocol as users can sort of perform DJ and strategies and, you know, try to become more Delta neutral as they earn rebase rewards. And yeah, that the rest is sort of history. All right. So maybe we can get to know sort of float yeah, I'm not sure how much you've looked into the synthetic asset space, but something when we were looking into it, we felt was, you know, CDPs, collateralized debt positions, um, you know, over collateralization. There were a lot of complexities in like creating a synthetic asset, right? And these frictions, you know, a CDP is a is a complex like financial term and it's a lot to grasp for, you know, a regular DeFi user. And the idea is, you know, if these things are only being taught like in grad school and, you know, some of them don't even exist traditionally, then there's a big barrier to entry for people to get involved in a lot of these, you know, types of systems. So the idea is like, is there a way for us to abstract a lot of that complexity? And what we can bring forth is a very clean, intuitive and simple product from the front allowing users to get hold of these, you know, MIAs. And that's that's essentially what we seek to do with Float. So there was a lot of building and experimentation. And I would say for sure we are we are thinkers. So whatever we want to do, we we say it, but then we, we think about it a lot and we think, oh, what if this happened? What if that happened? And, and we play scenarios through our head. And I'd say a lot of the work we do is, just like sitting around the table, you know, say having a coffee in the morning or a beer in the evening and just chatting through like the ideas and what ifs and, and brainstorming and talking. That's something we're big on. And after, you know, a fair amount of development, we released our alpha and an alpha version of a protocol is basically like the first, first, first extremely uh, bleeding edge and perhaps a little rough around the edges version of the protocol and this allows you in an alpha to do a lot of experimentation right so what we're building allowing users to take say these uh, leveraged long and short positions and have tokenized exposure this is you know the, the way we've constructed it it's quite a new and, and novel type of system that's not really you know been around when was the float capital alpha launch so that was about two months ago so it's pretty new and the idea was you know from since the last two months you know every couple of weeks let's uh, launch a new um, sort of asset and let's understand how it reacts and let's you know go from there 
What was your first asset that you launched? <laughs> the, the first one was called the Flippening. So the Flippening essentially represents the, the Ethereum market cap versus the, the Bitcoin market cap. So it's, it's that ratio. And what it allows users to basically do is either pile in on the side of Ethereum flipping Bitcoin or Bitcoin staying stronger. So I guess it's sort of like an ETH maxis versus BTC maxis. So how would that work? So if I was bullish on Ethereum and I bought some ETH flipping token, I would have exposure to like upside in the Ethereum to Bitcoin ratio. But who's kind of who's supplying me the the liquidity for that? Who does it cost when it goes up in price? Yeah, that's a that's a great point, Mark. So for the flippening, you have two liquidity pools and you can supply liquidity either the long side or the short side of the liquidity pool. And, you know, the long side of the liquidity pool in this case is the people betting that, you know, the flippening is going to happen and Ethereum is going to increase relative to Bitcoin. And the short side is believing the opposite. And as you provide liquidity to either side, and from day one, this liquidity is provided in the form of DAI, the stable coin. You get minted ERC-20 tokens or essentially shares in that liquidity pool. So if you imagine there's um, $100 on the, on the long side in that liquidity pool and there's $100 on the short side in that liquidity pool and there's 100 long tokens representing your share there and there's 100 short tokens representing your share there. Now, what happens is we have uh, we use Chainlink oracles and as the price of these Chainlink oracles updates and reflects, what we do is we'll take a look at that and we'll look at this, you know, ratio and we'll see if it's gone up or gone down or whatever's happened. And if it's, say, gone up by 1%, what we can do is we can look at those two liquidity pools and we can transfer collateral between those liquidity pools. So there was $100 in each liquidity pool. Now we could transfer $1 from the short side to the long side. And now there's $101 in the in the long liquidity pool. And there's only $99 in the short liquidity pool. And what that essentially means is those ERC-20 tokens you have, you can now burn them or redeem them for either more or for less collateral. And essentially what that just means is, you know, the price of what you have has gone up or it's gone down based on the movement of the flippening. Mm -hmm. And that happens programmatically, like it's uh, through a smart contract. There's no sort of actor making sure those balances are correct or? Correct. Yeah. So this is all happening at smart contract level. And how do you deal with sort of a mismatch there? Because I think the biggest problem with synthetics is that there's sort of more people who want to go long than people who want to go short. So how do you sort of provide incentives for people to enter the pools to get them more even so the product can work efficiently? Yeah, that's a seriously good question. And and that's a lot of, you know, what we have to basically incentivize for this protocol to work, right? So... Ohm has been, you know, a serious pioneer and shown how powerful it is to own sort of a liquidity in the protocol and use it. I would say w- what we've done is we use the protocol controlled value and I wouldn't say it's it's owned in the typical sense, but all of that liquidity in the long and the short pool, instead of that just staying stagnant and sitting in the smart contracts, we are basically contacting and using a yield manager contract to pipe that through into a certain borrowing and lending uh, platform. And in this case, we're doing it with Aave currently from day one. So what's happening is you've put collateral into either the long or the short side. That has all gone through to Aave and everything is earning interest. And all of that interest is either being directed to the short collateral pool or the long collateral pool and this is depending on the balance and if there's a mismatch in balance you know there'll just be say a small amount of short collateral and that will be earning interest on all of the collateral in both sides of the pool so that's one of the incentives some leveraged interest that you'll earn the second one now in the alpha 
is this a dynamic accrual of alpha float and alpha float very quickly is a non-transferable and non-tradable ERC20 token of, of the, the float capital protocol from day one. And this dynamic accrual works based on the amount of dollars you've staked. So when you mint a synth, you can stake it to earn this. And the amount of alpha float you earn is based on, you know, the time you've staked, the amount you've staked, but it's also based on the balance of liquidity in the market. So we, we've talked about these short and long liquidity pools. And if you're staking liquidity, that's very much in high demand. You're earning this thing at a much higher rate. So that was sort of for our alpha. We also launched a sort of form of funding rate. So this funding rate is basically a slow drip of capital from the overbalanced side of the market or the overbalanced liquidity pool to the underbalanced liquidity pool. And this essentially is causing a strong balancing effect. And just to give you some numbers, uh, before we introduced this, I would say the, there was about a 10 to 1 imbalance in the ohm market with quite a lot of short ohm positions and this was we can get into it now but you know users wanting to to remain dealt and neutral and capture the rebase rewards a really interesting strategy and this 10 to 1 ratio has gone down to literally only even two to one so there's been a massive massive um, improvement i would say in the balance of, of long and short liquidity um given this this new introduction of the funding rate, which is very cool. I think it's super cool that you're able to sort of have a more fluid type of collateral that's going and earning borrowing fees from Aave. That's quite a cool innovation. With the own pool, how, how big is that right now? Yeah, so that's a great question. So about three or four days ago, the own pool was at $1.3 million which was really cool. So quite a lot of users edging themselves out. And actually, the funding rates had a really interesting impact. It's actually decreased the liquidity quite a lot in the system. And basically, what that means is just there's a lot less capital needed to create the same type of outcome. So I guess while the, the liquidity or the TVL in that pool is decreased, that just represents that it's it's become a lot more efficient and you know a lot less capital is actually needed um, for for users to basically perform their desired strategies, which is really cool. Yeah, we at Agora recommend people never use leverage because it's like pretty dangerous. You can expose yourself to a lot of risks unless you understand what you're doing. But um, I'm sure you guys have a lot of educational documents and um, maybe some like guides for people to like get to understand that those products a bit better. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, just to comment on that, I totally agree with you. I mean, leverage is the number one uh, destroyer of, of a lot of people, you know, you quickly come in and you see, oh, I can get 20x leverage on this thing and you open a position. And before you know it, you don't realize that if you open a position on a traditional platform with 20x leverage, that means, you know, if there's a market movement of even just, you know, 5% not in your favor, you'll get liquidated. And even if it then comes and, and starts moving back up, you'll never be able to regain your, your principal. So it's it's incredibly um, <laughs> hectic. And I think it, it, it destroys a lot of people. So quite a cool thing is that in float capital, there's no liquidations. So the leverage is a lot is a lot more safe. Um, it just magnifies the the percentage movements, but there'll always be your collateral you can redeem for your tokens. So basically, just what it means is it's it's slightly more capital efficient with the, with the leverage. Meaning, you know, if you want to hedge out a thousand dollar own position, uh, sort of at, in its most basic, you'll only need five hundred dollars. You know, half the amount on float to to actually hedge out that position. And yeah, that's generally just makes it slightly more efficient. Mm, very cool. So what's the future look like for Float, John? Yeah, great question, Mark. So, I mean, the Alpha is this incredibly exciting point in time where we're going to continue doing lots of cool things and shipping. I think a big part of our, our journey right now is let's just ship, ship, ship. You know, the Alpha is the perfect test bed where 
you know, we can experiment and, you know, ship more crazy things and, you know, change things up wholesale and, you know, the users understand because it's this very early phase. So we shipped, you know, the funding rate this last week. We've shipped tons of new features on, on the UI. Uh, we went and going to ship new markets. We're looking at shipping a bit of multi-chain. So, yeah, the idea is just to really push the envelope with what we have now, which is working well, and continue to bring loads of different things, you know, new interesting, I would say, uh, MIAs, or magic internet assets to the platform that users can use. Um, yeah, multi-chain things. NFTs we have, I mean, little known fact, you can use certain NFTs to have discounts in our protocol already today. So it's just going to be yeah, continuing to build all those cool things uh, for now. And once we get more and more data and better and better understand how these types of different uh, mechanisms we've built react to different markets, from there we can create a lot of improvements and, you know, improve the protocol. Very cool. Yeah, I'm excited. I mean, there's... You can do so much stuff with like synthetics. You can make synthetic anything, right? <laughs> it's like as as much as your imagination can derive it, as long as you have two sides of uh, a market. But like, how do you kind of deal with the kind of super competitive environment that is sort of DeFi? Yeah, I mean, I think if there was no competition, it would move a lot slower and you know we, we would be less re less able to get out of bed i think it's awesome you know and if there was no competition then you know maybe what we would be building was there would be no demand for it it's you know it's validating that just, there's a lot of people building in the same space and there's a lot of users of these different products it's it's awesome and i think you know i think competition's great you know at the end of the day i think all the competitors are are awesome and it's it's great you know we all make each other better it's like we're all high performing sports teams and we get to play on the sport field and you know we're all practicing and we get to show off our moves and yeah it's it's really cool i mean i like it i think so many different teams are approaching it from different angles and creating different innovations and it's exciting you know we're all learning from each other and you know i think our team in particular the thing we're really strong at is tech and, and shipping good code so that's been really cool to see you know the velocity at which we we creating new features reacting to what we've seen in, in the system so you know very very happy on that and excited to be building alongside all the other legends and you know not not worried at all we just got to keep doing what we're doing which is building good code and you know the rest will follow so that's exciting yeah definitely so the A token that people are earning now, that'll be transferable to a governance token when you launch? Is that the plan? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the, the high level idea is that Alpha Bloat will yeah, convert into FLT, yeah, the governance token at a later point in time. And that exact date is not set yet just because we're doing a lot of, you know, good thinking into how that will all pan out and you know how, how do we design the tokenomics and you know what promotes best sort of long-term sustainability so yeah we're going to keep on getting that right and there's that whole component as well as the whole sort of core functioning of the protocol component and they're quite intertwined and yeah we're going to keep working on that yeah there's a it's a super interesting it's because you can do whatever you want, right? <laughs> and you want to do the best thing and the most innovative thing with your governance token as well to sort of set the long-term success of the protocol with like Uniswap kind of not really having very much of a function and then Curve building out this sort of value mechanism that's sort of got a 10-year tail. It's, um, yeah, it's a really interesting problem, isn't it? Uh, super interesting, yeah. No, it's, it's really exciting. So... Yeah, man, just going to keep on building, which is exciting. Cool. Well, thanks so much for coming on, John. John, is there people you'd like to shout out and then we can maybe grab your like socials and sort of where people can go if they want to uh, explore more about Float Capital? Yeah, for sure. So I'd say firstly, float.capital, you can hit us up over there and you see on the website, there'll be links to our, our Twitter and Discord um, our Discord's really active and there's got a lot of cool things happening over there. And yeah, Mark, thanks so much for 
for having us on and, and shout out to yeah all the Glotonians, absolute legends in the community so far. You guys are are making it is what it is today and shout out to yeah all of the rest uh, of the float team. I think we all contributing well to this protocol and let's just keep building guys we, we're doing some good stuff perfect well thanks so much for coming john john and letting the omis know about what you're building over there and hopefully we can collab together uh, in the future on some more cool stuff absolutely seriously interesting awesome mark yeah thank you so much all right, perfect. All right, Omis, that's uh, our interview with John John from Float Capital. Until next time, see you, Omis. <laughs>